Welcome to NCBA's Cattleman's Call podcast with host Lane Nordland. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cattleman's Call podcast. Lane Nordland with you here today. It's been a busy fall for so many of us up in the northern tier of the country where I call home. The fall run is underway. A lot of shipping going on, cattle heading to the Midwest, and some snow finally falling in parts of uh, the Rocky Mountain West that wildfires have just ravaged, uh, particularly here in uh, late summer and early fall. Some great relief uh, for producers impacted by wildfire. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today it is natural disaster, not wildfire uh, in particular for this show, but uh, the uh, impact that hurricanes have had on the southeastern part of the nation. And we're going to be joined today by members of the Florida Cattlemen's Association. Alex Johns and Dale Carlton are joining us. They're producers there in Florida who have been impacted by uh, the recent hurricanes in that region. Uh, Dale currently serves as the FCA president, and Alex is a past president of the association and a member of the Seminole Tribe of Florida as well. So, gentlemen, as as you join us here on the podcast today, uh, Dale, I'll I'll start with you. Uh, how, how are things going with two hurricanes now in the rearview mirror? How are things for for the operation and yourself? Well, it's really going good. There, uh, we got obviously some cleanup to do, and um, but as a whole, we on our family operations, we made out made out in pretty good shape with the these two. A lot of people got a lot more water than than we did we 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 experienced that in 2022 with ian where we had a couple feet of water and there's people up in the north part of the uh, north up north of us that are uh experiencing a lot of water damage more than wind damage still a lot of wind damage but there's a lot of water sticking around alex for yourself uh how are things uh, shaking out here and look with things in the rearview mirror we're in pretty good shape ourselves. Um, you know, had a little fence damage, some wind damage, quite a bit of water, but you know, a lot of our neighbors got a lot worse. So we've got all our stuff tidied up and we are able to go out and help our neighbors now. So it's going to be a long cleanup process, but you know, thankfully we'll get through it. No. Well, again, neighbors helping neighbors. That's what we're about here in rural America. It doesn't matter where you live at or where your operation is at. You know, before we we dive too too far into uh, our discussions around hurricane relief and rebuilding, uh, uh, Dale, I'll I'll, I'll start with you on this question. Let's just talk about your your background there in Florida in the cattle business and uh, and your family's involvement and uh, what what your operation, uh, what, what you run down there. Okay, we're, um, I'm actually, I'm eighth generation Floridian, sixth generation rancher. My family's been in the business for a very long time. That's all I know. We have a cow-calf operation um, that we have places in three counties that are connected to each other. Um, and we're a family business. My, my dad and mom and there's myself and my sister and, and uh, and I have three boys and my sister has a boy and a girl and well, they're actually grown, but, and, uh, and everybody's involved. Um, that's kind of, that's our story. We have, uh, I think we have, there's, I counted it up. There's about 11 of us that are all work together in one way or the other on the ranch. Well, thanks for, for that insight. And, and Alex, I'll pose the same question for you. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> member of Seminole Tribe of Florida. Our family is about 4,500 members. Um, <laughs> we, we operate um, from North Central Florida all the way to South Florida, several different counties, um, mostly cow-calf operation. We do got some farming interests, but uh, mostly cow-calf. So been in Florida quite a long time. Yep. Well, uh, gentlemen, I, I thank you for joining us. And uh, it's not fun to talk about natural disasters or, or when when issues, you know, throw off daily daily operations. But uh, we appreciate you joining us here today because I think it's so important for all of our fellow cattle producers to to hear 
uh, you know, uh, how things are going, how they can help and uh, know that they're not alone, say, if wildfires impacting them up here in the Rocky Mountain West or, or hurricane and, and rebuilding after that down in your neck of the woods. You know, we, we had Hurricane Helene hit and then then Milton hit as well. So when that first round of hurricanes with Helene hit you all, um, what what was that like? And, and what 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 was the initial uh uh, thoughts after the hurricane hit and then knowing you had Milton on the way too. I guess what what is it like preparing for a hurricane in cattle country? There's quite a bit to do. You have to obviously get things tied down and hope and in their safe place and open up enough pasture for your cattle to be able to let their natural instincts take over and find their safe place as well. And just then you get really ready to recover and to be able to to um help other people and just it's really one of those things where everybody comes together and and works together and that's really how we get through it and what's that like though i i mean i i've been down in florida on some on some ranches and a lot different than our wide open pastures here in montana what is the prep like when you're we're, when you're trying to maybe locate or move cattle beforehand and then after that hurricane hits or any storm what to, what is that like and and what's it like working with your neighbors and everybody coming together just to find cattle or, or and uh and make sure everything's accounted for i'll i'll take this one man this is alex um <clears throat> we've gotten pretty good at prepping for these things it's 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 mostly clean up afterwards but prepping you know we're opening gates, making sure cattle have access to high ground and they'll figure it out. You know, they got pretty good instincts there. Um, you know, but afterwards is really where the work starts and all the, you know, the team players come together. <clears throat> Mostly we're trying to keep cattle off of highways, you know, for liability purposes, checking fences, boundary fences. Um, first we go check, make sure everybody's alive and healthy but after that we just start riding fences chainsawing our way in and out um, a lot of times we're the first folks on the ground before first responders are there we cut the trees out of the way and get get the roads open where the paramedics can get down them um, a lot of their your ag folks you know they own the equipment the heavy equipment that can do all the pushing so we get a bunch of chainsaws and guys together and we do prep we're, i mean we've got we, all our ranches have plenty of fuel, plenty of water, plenty of power tools, plenty of equipment. Everything's moved up to high ground. So as soon as the storm hits, we're able to jump into equipment and go. Yep. So, you know, and then after that, if um, typically if it doesn't hit our home place very hard and we're able, we will travel to wherever the location is that it did hit where other neighbors are going to be experiencing more issues that we can go help them. I think during Helene, we were we were there six hours after the storm. The cattleman's was on location six hours after the storm, and we were pushing roads out for for EMS and police to get in and out of communities, and trying to organize with our friends up there to make sure that they had everything they needed. So um, it's mostly clean up for us. We've gotten pretty good at addressing them when they come. It's just you know we don't know what we're dealing with to, after it's gone. It, when Helene hit, does that water recede if you have a, you know, whether it's rain or a little surge in, 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 in the round water level, I guess, what, what does that look like when, when you're, when you're looking at uh, cleaning up, does that water level stay pretty high or is it just, uh, does it recede pretty fast? And then you're, you're left to, to clean up what it did leave behind there on the ground in the open spaces. They're, they're all different. Um, to be honest with you, uh, Milton for us was a fairly dry storm. We got most of the rain prior. Um, Helene was a wet, a wet storm. Um, you go back to Ian, that was a super wet storm. Mm -hmm. But you'll find places where, yeah, if you get you get hit with a pile of rainwater and it's in low country, you could be neck deep in places. Milton was different. It it seemed that where we were working at the water got higher afterwards because all the rivers started filling up and, and uh, you know, it, it took several days for the rivers to crest. So it, we continued to see flooding there. Places that were dry when we arrived were starting to be underwater when we left. So, um, you know, that we took some relocation of cattle and stuff in those areas, but every one of them seems to be a little bit different. Uh, Dale might want to add to that. Uh, 
no, for sure. They're, they're all been different and we've, we've been, uh, we've had the opportunity to deal with several of them and it seems like none of them are exactly the same for the same people. Um, so it's, that's part of the problem. It's part of the things that makes it difficult to prep too much because we don't know exactly where it's going to hit. You know, we have an idea, but we don't know exactly who's going to be impacted. So you kind of have to wait for it to get through and, uh, and deal with it then. Now, obviously, watching the the national news when Milton uh, uh, had hit and folks were, were looking at the damage, a lot of it was the leftover cleanup of folks piling all their tree limbs and everything else up in the, you know, in their yards and street cleaning up after Helene and more of that damage was caused by their cleanup efforts. And so obviously I'm, I'm assuming that that was kind of uh, something you all experienced too, when, when you're starting to clean up after those storms, uh, how were things looking on your operation? And, and uh, obviously it's always tough having to clean things up when you know, you could, could be doing other things on the ranch, uh, more important depending on the time of the year, but uh, you got to be able to function. So I guess, well, how, how are things for, for yourself? and maybe some of your, your fellow producers that got hit a little harder uh, for both these hurricanes. What's, what's, the, what's the layout look like on the landscape? Well, it basically pushes you back a month minimum because you pretty much stop your normal day-to-day operation that's going on and, and you got a, a storm to deal with. So we've had actually, counting Debbie, you know, we've had three storms make direct hit in the last, what, Alex, five weeks, yeah. six weeks. Um, two real close to the same place up in the Big Bend, and then Milton came across the middle of the state like it did. Mm-hmm. So it's it's one of those things. Each each storm is different to get ready to do what we need to do. I forgot about Little Debbie there a few weeks ago too. Um, gosh darn! I I just I tip my hat to you you guys that that ranch down in that that area. I've I've been able to tour down there at some different country, and, and obviously we we have all of our different issues and and, and nutrition and, and and management of our cattle herds depending on where we call home. I guess when you're looking at animal health, what what are some protocols that you put in place? Uh, when you're starting to clean up and, and check on cattle, what, what are some things you've all learned when you're, when you're looking at these cattle and accounting for them and, and making sure they're all in, in tip top shape? Well, it's different in different areas once again. So if, let me go back to Milton. So if you got to the higher country where those cattle were at, as you can imagine, the only water access they had was well water. So if you don't have power, you don't have wells, Cattle don't have water, so there's a lot of coordinating to haul fresh water to cattle, which is a job in itself. And then we do a lot of, you know, accessing generators and getting generators hooked up to different well sites so they can pump water. If you get back down to our area, we have natural groundwater year round. And if we get two foot of rain, we've got plenty of water. The, the issue then becomes, you know, calving. We're right in the middle of calving season. You know, cows are dropping calves and um, you know, if, if, if they don't have anywhere dry to get, you lose a lot of calves and the impact will be felt for a, for a good year. We won't really know what the impact is until mm-hmm. probably next calving season. If, if they did survive this one, did they breed back? You know, yeah. nutrition is going to always be an issue after a storm because your grass gets pretty washy. Um, there's several people that's having to feed hay now because all the grass basically flooded out. Um, all the, any annual crops they planted are gone. It did a lot of damage to road crops. So it's, uh, you know, we're going to feel the impact for a long time. And and also the pecans up in, uh, up in that area. I mean, those, they were devastated. There's probably not a pecan left on a tree up there. So Hmm. it it hurt them pretty good as well. Cotton, peanuts hurt all those guys. So it's not just the ranchers. It hurt, hurt several different ag industries here. Man, you know, you, you bring up, just the cattle nutrition and the impact the stress has on our, our mama cows out there, I guess, are there some resources through state extension and, and whatnot too on, on maybe some studies of, of watching these cattle and just how different uh, tropical storms and hurricanes and uh, how that really does impact breed back and, and cattle health, but also, you know, some strategies that producers can implement uh, in, in trying to keep those cows as healthy as possible. Cause again, I, this is whole new area for me when, when thinking about uh, cattle stress, but uh, obviously that's, it's so important for all, for all of you down there. 
Yeah, Extension really jumped in. We learned a lot after Hurricane Michael. So Hurricane Michael came through in a, a big bend area and devastated that place. I think it was a Cat 5 when it hit. But um, it ruined it. And the aftermath, a month later, we were noticing cattle were dying. And it turned out, you know, Extension got involved and was trying to figure out what was going, going on. Was it bad water? But it turned out that, you know, the cattle were turning to eat and feed. They wouldn't normally mm. eat, a lot of it being toxic weeds so we lost quite a few cattle up there but uh, extension does put out you know some papers on on how to handle situations post hurricane um things about nutrition stuff like that but i want to kind of toot um the florida cattlemen's association's horn here and, and dale dale carlton especially so we uh recently we've been doing storm recovery for past seven or eight years as an association I think we really started during Hurricane Michael and we started ramping up and getting a little more organized. And then Dale recently um, started a new committee. I think we call it Hurricane Re or Disaster, Disaster Response. Relief. Disaster Relief and Response. Yeah. Justin White is the committee chair of it. He did a good job of um, rallying supplies and manpower together. And um, Pat Durden, the past president, started delegating you know, logistically where we should deploy to. Um, we kind of, I mean, I don't want to toot our horn, but we kind of, kind of got to be a well-oiled machine when these hurricanes blow through. We can, we know where to move to, where to go, how to survive. Um, you mentioned Hurricane Milton coming in after Helene. Well, it, 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 when we were up there in Helene, nobody had any service, no, no news. We didn't even know another hurricane was coming. So we found out as soon as we got home, you know, and everybody's telling us. There's another one coming. <laughs> we had to prep for another one. So, um, you know, when you get to these storm areas, there's no power, there's no no uh, no service, no cell service a lot of times. So it gets pretty difficult to communicate. And, and that was going to be my next. Uh, I'll toot your horn for you uh, uh, <laughs> for Florida cattlemen. I mean, when you look at that too, I, I think so so much of the populace and consumers they, they don't understand yeah the storm hits but there's so much that goes into rebuilding fence clearing stuff out again we talked about animal health and nutrition but just being able to have those resources so when you're looking at just having these resources whether it's financial or donations and feed or equipment whatever it might be uh, dale can, can you maybe expand upon just the relationship building that is taking place in and focusing on das, uh, disaster rebuilding and and how important it is to have those relationships on the state and, and 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 federal level and also on the county level but also just reaching out and seeing support from your fellow producers several states away as well well that's that's uh one of the reasons that i would toot our horn as an association too and i'll take it all to our executive director mr hanley he he has unbelievable relationships scattered throughout our whole industry. He has unbelievable relationships scattered out through our state. And you get him and a few of us making a few phone calls, working together. And then you got your anybody to do with ag and definitely anybody to do with our industry or also you're not even having to call them. They're wanting to know what they need to be able to do to help. Um, I call that a blessing. And, and that's, that's basically what just get on the phone and everybody it it, bring, it literally really brings the ag industry and the cattle industry brings them together like we're supposed to be together and it's just kind of a natural thing the natural draw that happens and alex for yourself too uh, my family we, we ranch on the fort belknap indian reservation up here we're members of the grovant nation um uh, from from the the seminole tribes perspective uh, what are some resources that that they provide to in the in the work and the collaboration that that takes place to to help pre producers and, and tribal members across the state as well well they um you know locally for the tribal members we we have several different services we provide you know all the way from human health, um, sanitation, as well as fuel, generators, food, things like that. And our tribal council allows us, as soon as the storm is over and our family members are taking care of the ability to go out and help our neighbors, and we're able to utilize our manpower and our equipment and um, some of our fuel and water 
food resources, things of that to carry to these disaster areas. So the tribe, our tribe works real, really well in, in uh, cooperation with the Florida Cattlemen's Association and getting around. And we have tribal members scattered all over the United States and a lot in North Florida where these things hit. So once we get up there, you know, we make sure our family members are taken care of and then we, we start helping our neighbors again. I'm going to jump in there, Lane. Our uh, association is, there's no, there aren't words big enough to say how much we appreciate the Seminole tribe and how, what a job Alex does, how he brings the two together without uh, taking advantage of either one. It's just a natural draw and it's a, almost like a partnership that's turned into over the years to work together and then to also realize that there's strength in numbers and really strength in numbers of good people working together for the same cause. So Alex and the Seminole tribe deserve a big shout out and a lot of love. Very well said, Dale. And, you know, you you look at this too, and neighbors helping neighbors, getting everybody back back and, and up and going uh, in as fast a manner as possible. You know, we, we do know that there is always programs on the federal level uh, through USDA and, and other agencies. Uh, I, I guess when, when you look at uh, some of these, these programs, uh, I'm trying to think of the one. They got such long acronyms. I'm not even going to try to, to share them all. But I guess what what are some of those that have worked really well and, and are aiding producers? And, and what are some that that maybe need a little work and, and just the number of storms that have come through? And and I guess what, what what's your what are your thoughts and, and what are some of the advocacy you do in, in making sure that there is federal aid available for when natural disaster does strike? Well, there are some good agencies and we do get a lot of help. The one thing that the improvement that needs to be that needs to be able to be more streamlined. That is what it what we run into is there's been so many and so much at one time over the last seven or eight years that there's a backup on a lot of that assistance and it's years, couple years, sometimes in Michael's case, five years before people got their their disaster assistance and and that would be the biggest thing that you end up getting it but it takes a long time where you've already had to come out of the pocket to pay and it's I'm not going to say it's too late but it kind of is sometimes but that's the that's the biggest hurdle that I think there is with the FSA and the USDA and all those programs that that help and they're very good and I don't want to paint a negative picture about that but it's just there's so much so many hoops to jump through to get it that that's the thing we got to get we hope we can get fixed. And, I, and our commissioner, I read something today where he's actually working on getting some of that stuff streamlined and it'll be hard. He's got to have a lot of support too. <laughs> now, you know, I, I, you, th you mentioned uh, the, the different sectors, cotton, pecans, uh, poultry comes to mind too. I, I know, especially up north there in Georgia, a lot of poultry facilities were taken out in that storm and also in the Carolinas. What, what, what are you hearing from the, your poultry colleagues in, in Florida, maybe those surrounding states, on the impact that these storms have had on poultry production, uh, meaning protein, uh, in, in, the, in the consumer pipeline and, and how, how quick they can rebuild? I, we, we know how fast a poultry, the poultry industry can rebuild when they have to depopulate when disease comes through. But I think it's just another factor of when their facilities are are. are uh, taken down as well. I guess, what are you hearing around that? Because I've had a lot of people ask me how how the storms will impact uh, the poultry protein input. I, I'm going to say in Florida, it was a big impact on poultry from what we've seen. Um, I mean, they lost their entire houses. They, everything was gone. Um, chicken feathers everywhere and barns collapsed and exploded. Um, every The areas we were in, there wasn't a chicken house standing. So it it had to have a big impact on them. I haven't heard much, but I know they're, you know, they're in bad shape just like the rest of us are. Well, again, we, we, we sympathize with all, all the producers out there impacted by this. And I know we're focusing on cattle, but uh, we're all in agriculture and we all get up and put our boots on uh, no matter what the day is. And our sympathies are with everybody. And I should mention uh, to our friends listening if you're wondering how you can help uh, play a role in uh, disaster relief, I would encourage you to check out the ncba.org slash producer slash disaster relief resources or just uh, Google 
in CBA disaster relief because they uh, they have a great lineup for hurricane relief, um, the resources for producers impacted by those storms uh, or or by wildfire, whatever uh, that natural disaster can be. And they also have direct uh, links to the state affiliates like the Florida Cattlemen's Association on how you can help these producers on the ground as well. And, uh, uh, you know, when, when we look at this, Dale, I guess what, what have been the number one things that producers, uh, obviously, uh, you're going out, you're helping, you're clearing the roads, helping people uh, get medical attention. But what, what have been some of the biggest needs here this summer and fall that producers uh, have really needed um, uh, to, to help get back to, to normal? Well, what the storm does, most of the damage it leaves is pretty labor intensive. And, and that, that's where where a lot of it is, like Alex said, most of, most of us have some equipment and some stuff like that, but it's so much at one time that a normal size ranch crew would it take, we, well, we can't hardly get cleaned up in between storms now, but it just, it takes so much. And that, that is, that's, it overwhelms a lot of people up there in the big bend area. Some of the things that were sad to me, those, some older people, generational people have been up there their whole life on their four or 500 acres that they have some cows and they also have some hay in their crop. And they're talking about it's not worth it anymore, giving up, especially on the cow end of things. And that, that's, you know, that's heartbreaking when you love the industry like we do. And Alex, from your perspective too, I guess, uh, how, how do these storms make you think ahead and, and plan and, and look at different resources and, and making sure that you can be as prepared as possible when, when these storms do hit? Well, the biggest thing I see from all the experience we've had with these storms is making sure your fence lines are pretty much void of trees. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. The biggest damage is having trees laid down on your fence. But, um, you know, we do keep our fence lines sprayed back. But, you know, it, it, as Dale mentioned, you get up in North Florida, it's just forest. And there's a lot of tree damage and it takes a lot of work. And the biggest need we have is probably for labor. But there again, fence materials and, and probably short-term cattle feed. Um, but fen fencing, you know, is so expensive. And that's what a lot of these older folks are looking at is the cost of repairing the fence, replacing the fence and the labor to do it. And sadly, some of them are just, you know, bowing, bowing in and saying that they're probably done after this one. Um, they just get hit back to back and can't get cleaned up from the last one. So it, it's sad to see. We do, we do what we can with our small crews, but we have to go home to our families and take care of our stuff as well. And, um, it's going to be a long cleanup process, but um, if we, any of those donations that come in, they're, they're put in good hands with NCBA. And we also have the Florida Cattlemen's Association. We take donations here, and we've had a lot of um, a lot of different folks, private folks, donate money, um, and that's a big help, especially short term. When we we first get into this, we don't really know what we've got. We have no stockpile, so we're trying to rally together and find materials where we can get them and get them paid for and mm -hmm. those folks that make those private donations it goes a long ways now, now i'm curious what 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 type what, what is your normal fencing material obviously up here we're t posts and well all those 120 year old uh cedar posts are, are are specialties around here that our forefathers put in the ground but you know a, a mile of fence people it, it could be fifteen twenty thousand dollars here in montana where i call home depending on the terrain and materials needed uh what's it cost down there roughly to put in a mile of fence and and what are the what what, what do you use on, on those fence lines down, down there in some of that swampy country yeah i mean we're similar as far as cost goes you know it's according to what kind of clearing has to be done Mm -hmm. you know that that cost would be without clearing but you get up in north florida i mean a, a big d8 bulldozer can't move some of those trees so it's a you know it's a lot of hand labor so it, it takes quite a bit to get some of them fence lines cleared where you can actually string a new fence but we we're primarily bob wire down here and, and pressure treated post mm -hmm. and, and the cost of everything's up so yeah it's it's a it's a high cost of fencing for sure 
Now, uh, looking ahead, uh, what, uh, what what are some uh, maybe looking at some of the positive things out there? I know we're focused on on, on the disaster and, and rebuilding right now, but what are some other things the Florida Cattlemen's Association is up to to, to help uh, grow the presence of, of uh, the cattle industry there in Florida and and uh, of course one of the fastest growing uh, states, of course, in the nation. But uh, what are some things that you guys are working on and looking towards the future of uh, the cattle industry and the oldest cattle industry in, in the U.S. as well? Well, one push we're making this this year is um, is our membership. We uh, I'll give you a little history on that. In 2019, we we had a dues increase, a much needed dues increase. We needed some more staff. We needed some some seats at some tables like the water management district places, um, and we needed we needed to upgrade that. And so we had a, we hadn't had a dues increase in 20 years. We increased our dues, and then right behind that, COVID hit. And it really put us you know, it, it knocked a hole in our membership by about 800, 850 members. So that being said, this year we're, we stopped the bleed and we got it headed back in the right direction. It'll take a couple years to, to get us back where we were. And hopefully we're hoping to increase that. And right now on our government level, we're, we're sitting in, we have an opportunity to be in real good shape. Our commissioner of agriculture, Wilton Simpson, he's a farmer, he's a, chicken farmer and he has some cows too um uh the soon-to-be senate president is a ag guy too he's mainly citrus but he's for all ag um we got pretty good support ag does in tallahassee right now um and hopefully with everything going on with the disasters and stuff having people that have a heart for ag is definitely a huge help to us so the main thing that we're working on we feel like if you know we there's strength in numbers and and we need and and the game and the governmental part of things is bigger than it's ever been so those are the things that the main things we got going on right now and i'll i'll add to that um you know something that i, I seen when we left milton and helene um is that just the goodwill of all the florida cattlemen crews that showed up we had crews all over it could be a two-man crew or a 10-man crew, but we were scattered in several counties and just the goodwill that these guys were putting forward. Um, they were helping people in neighborhoods that didn't even own a cow or a chicken. They, if the person needed the help, they helped them. But those people seem to be buying memberships as well, and, and, and they're also trying to recruit other people because they've seen what Florida Cattlemen Association does when they show up. So I want to I want to just um, thank all those guys that were out there doing work for just your average Joe and getting their their lifestyle back in somewhat normal. Now I'm looking at uh, your convention website that that's in June and is your slogan for the convention this year loyal to the land? Am I reading that right? Yes, sir. That uh, actually past president Alex Johns started a whole a hashtag thing. He kind of got our association kicked off with social media into things, which has been a huge, huge asset and a very good improvement since then. But as each incoming president has come up with their own slogan or theme and, and loyal to the land is mine for the, for this year. And it actually started at convention on the Thursday or last night, Thursday night. So that's our yearly slogan or hashtag or theme or whatever you want to call it. Uh -huh. I think that's one of the best themes or slogans I've seen for a, an agriculture association in quite a long time, because I mean, just about our conversation here today, we're loyal to the land, we're loyal to our neighbors, we're loyal to our cattle and in the industry. So again, a lot going on, a lot of rebuilding, a, a lot of sweating <laughs> it, it left to do too. Not, not only do you have to clean up after two storms, you, you have to lobby, you have to stay in business. And uh, again, Florida Cattlemen's Association, Jim Hanley and the team there, of course, on the, on the staff doing a fine job of, uh, of being a voice for all the producers there in Florida as well. You know, gentlemen, one year, one year, I will, I, I want to come down to, to the convention there. That that looks like a lot different than our Montana Stock Growers Convention during December when it's usually, you know, 20 below zero. Uh, that, that looks pretty nice down there on the beach where you guys have convention meetings. <laughs> it's not any fun. You wouldn't enjoy it. <laughs> I tell you what, if you come, we'll get you a room. All right. Well, I'll, I'll uh, 
my, my wife might have to, she, I don't think she'd allow me to go on that one without her, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, put, we'll, we'll put that one on the, on the schedule maybe for, for 2025. But uh, uh, Dale and Alex, we, we, we talked a lot about, uh, you know, what, what you guys saw, the rebuilding efforts, just uh, anything else you would just like to share with your fellow cattle producers tuning in to the, to the podcast today? Uh, I would just say, you know, if, if, you know, if you're in the cattle industry and you see a neighbor in need, just be willing to lend a hand. I know if, uh, the, if the Seminole tribe needed help, Dale and all the cattlemen would be there to help us. So, you know, it's just, a, it, we're all one family and we're all here to help each other. So let's just keep doing what we do. I, I'll echo Alex. I'm a firm believer that there's strength in numbers. The more of us like-minded people banding together, the better we are, the more we get done. And also stay loyal to your land. Well, gentlemen, thank you for joining us here today. I, I know you got a busy, busy few months ahead of you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you down in uh, San Antonio for CattleCon 25. That's the 4th through the 6th of February, a little promotion for that event as well. Uh, get registered, get your housing. That's uh, all can be found at ncba.org slash producers. I had to say it so many times on Cattleman to Cattleman the other day. I probably didn't get that right. So I'll make sure and uh, have the correct details in the podcast description for convention, but also the disaster relief as well, friends. But uh, with that, Alex and Dale, thanks for joining us here today. All right. Thanks, thanks for having us. Thank you. All right, friends. Thanks for answering the Cattleman's Call. I'm Wayne Nordlund. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for tuning in to NCBA's Cattleman's Call podcast with Lane Nordland. For more information, visit ncba.org and make sure to subscribe to the podcast today.